So, welcome. Good morning. Welcome to um, Frankfurt on, a, again, a rainy and grey day to um, the public hearing um, in the context of um, the consultation on the approach for the recognition of institutional protection schemes. Um, we will start this morning with a short presentation and then we are um, at your disposal for questions. Um, with me here on the podium um, is um, Yuka Vesela, Director General of DGMS3, and um, Esther Wehmeyer, a Principal Supervisor in uh, the same Director Generate. Um, so I think uh, without further ado, we go into the presentation and um, we are then looking forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wolf, and uh, good morning also from uh, uh, my behalf, and welcome to this uh, event. Uh, this is part on uh, this is part of our um, uh, public consultation on our IPS uh, criteria, and uh, uh, we started this consultation. Uh, First of all, because uh, it is a good uh, practice to be transparent on important uh, uh, policy issues, and then this issue is uh, very relevant for uh, some parts of the banking sector, and uh, I think the people who are here uh, are the ones uh, who are mostly uh, interested in this, uh, this topic. So starting with the, the um, um, description of uh, uh, the IPS, uh, this is uh, of course uh, well known to you. Um, IPS, uh, what is the, the uh, object of our criteria, is uh, um, a contractual uh, arrangement uh, which uh, is intended to protect uh, member institutions uh, in case of uh, liquidity and solvency problems, and uh, it's intended, uh, as also stated in the regulation, uh, to avoid uh, a bank bankruptcy of a single uh, institution that is member of these uh, arrangements. So it's a sort of a solidarity mechanism across uh, the institutions, uh, and it's important to note that it's not uh, a consolidated banking group. So the banks that are part of an IPS uh, are not uh, subject to consolidated uh, supervision, and they are not uh, treated in, in the same way as uh, uh, groups that are subject to consolidation, which uh, can be in many ways regarded as a single entity from a supervisory uh, perspective. So these are the uh, groups uh, that uh, have been established under the Article 10 uh, of the uh, CRR. So the members of the IPS are still uh, autonomous institutions and they are supervised uh, uh, on an individual basis. And that is, then what is especially relevant from uh, the ECP perspective and the reason why we took particular interest uh, in this topic is that uh, in this IPS uh, that are currently there, uh, we typically have uh, both uh, significant and less uh, significant institutions and then also you can have uh, this uh, consolidated groups that are also IPS. Uh, so there is a possibility of being both a consolidated group and an IPS. Um, and we don't uh, have many cases where the, um, the IPS is just uh, consisting of less significant institutions, but typically there are both a significant and uh, less significant uh, institutions. Uh, and especially relevant, the IPS are for cooperative banks uh, and savings banks. Um, what is the relationship between IPS and the deposit guarantee schemes? Uh, this is an important um, uh, point to note uh, as well. Um, we can have cases that uh, and the IPS uh, is recognized as uh, the deposit guarantee system. Uh, and uh, then uh, provides the protection of, of, of deposits. Uh, but uh, the uh, IPS uh, doesn't have to be uh, uh, the deposit guarantee uh, system as well. Uh, this is a possibility that uh, is there uh, for uh, countries uh, to organize uh, deposit uh, guarantee according to the, uh, to the uh, requirements of the uh, deposit guarantee directive. Uh, we are not um, in the ECB uh, responsible for the uh, supervision um, uh, of the uh, deposit guarantee systems. For instance, we are not responsible for uh, recognizing whether the deposit guarantee systems are adequate. 
uh, our responsibilities um, uh, relate to the IPS and uh, the institutions that are part of, 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 the, of the IPS. There are some uh, duties for supervisors regarding deposit guarantee systems, but it's not uh, the uh, competence for uh, 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 recognizing these, uh, these systems as uh, uh, delivering a sufficient uh, deposit uh, guarantee. And then there is also the issue that if an IPS is also a deposit guarantee system, uh, the, the funds need to be also, of course, available uh, for deposit guarantee, uh, which is, uh, um, uh, which is uh, uh, at minimum 0.8% uh, of the covered deposits that need to be uh, existing in the ex-ante funds, and this uh, can then uh, limit the funds that are available for solvency support purposes if the, uh, the IPS is also uh, a deposit guarantee system. So this is one aspect that we, of course, need to take uh, into account. Um, regarding the uh, regulation of, of uh, IPS, and this is uh, uh, the core issue for us uh, regarding our approach to IPS, uh, there is on one side uh, the, this beneficial uh, system that protects uh, the, the solvency and liquidity of individual institutions and is uh, uh, reducing significantly the risk of failure at the level of uh, individual institutions. So this is a clearly uh, a benefit uh, coming from an IPS system. Uh, but then on the other side, uh, uh, this uh, IPS uh, can also have a, a regulatory um, benefits uh, which are quite significant. So in a way, if there is an IPS that, that is credible in producing this uh, support, then we can have these uh, regulatory benefits. Uh, and the regulatory benefits can be obtained if the IPS meets uh, uh, the certain conditions that are listed in the uh, uh, in the CRR, and then what we have done is that we have uh, uh, considered then how we actually uh, supervise that this, uh, these conditions are met, and we have developed some additional practical criteria for that, which is now also subject to, to, uh, to uh, consultation. So what these um, um, regulatory benefits are, um, if an IPS is recognized, then there is a zero risk weight for exposures across the IPS members, and there are no large exposure limits. So these are quite significant benefits. And then there can be further waivers if IPS is meeting this, this criteria, and there can be waivers from liquidity requirements. Uh, which then, which, which then, in a way, allow, in a way, uh, liquidity um, supervision at the level of the whole uh, system. Um, the IPS uh, currently, what we have, uh, uh, can be found in three countries: Austria, Germany, and Spain. Uh, but we, if we look at the total number of uh, credit institutions uh, in the SSM, uh, we have uh, actually 50% of the total number covered by IPS. So in that sense, uh, this is a highly significant uh, issue. Uh, and then in terms of assets, uh, we are covering uh, roughly 10%, so also very significant, uh, significant parts. Um, uh, in Austria, we have uh, eight IPS with uh, 370 member institutions. In Germany, uh, uh, only two, uh, but uh, big ones with uh, 1,465 member institutions, um, uh, also in the cooperative and savings bank uh, sector. Uh, and then we have in, in Spain uh, two um, uh, IPS, uh, which uh, uh, one of them, uh, Casa Mar, is a significant institution, and then uh, Solvencia is less significant, and these are also, um, uh, also uh, then uh, uh, consolidated uh, groups. And then we have also credit unions uh, in Spain uh, with uh, an IPS. Um, if I go uh, more uh, into the uh, substance of the uh, work that we have uh, been carrying out for uh, more than a year now, uh, something like one and a half years, we started with the uh, stock take of uh, uh, the IPS that are there 
um, we looked at uh, the uh, tasks uh, of the uh, IPS uh, centers, uh, how the governance risk monitoring is organized. Uh, we looked at the uh, development of uh, ex ante funds for solvency support purposes, uh, etc. Uh, and then after that, uh, also having a lot of discussions with the uh, uh, national authorities and with these uh, existing IPS themselves, we started developing uh, these uh, criteria. And the main uh, objective is that we should have a common approach uh, for supervisory purposes uh, across the SSM uh, in order to have a consistent approach. Um, and uh, in particular, if there would be new uh, applications uh, for having an IPS, then we would uh, have this uh, consistent and common uh, approach how to address these uh, applications. Uh, and then also for the existing uh, IPS, um, uh, there has to be uh, um, a regular monitoring, at least an annual monitoring, uh, which also uh, contains a check whether the IPS continues to meet uh, these uh, criteria, and then also uh, how the risk uh, monitoring uh, of individual members is uh, uh, conducted in, in, the, uh, in the IPS. Um, we are not uh, challenging the previous uh, uh, decisions by national authorities when they um, uh, uh, recognized the IPS and then allowed these regulatory uh, benefits um, that's not the purpose. Uh, uh, we are in a way now starting, uh, starting this uh, assessment work uh, and the objective is not, not really to, to start by, uh, by challenging these uh, uh, previous decisions, uh, but to uh, understand even better the IPS uh, and then see if there are some areas where uh, improvements uh, uh, would be needed in the way that the IPS uh, function. Um, the, uh, the fact that we have uh, both uh, uh, significant and less significant institutions typically uh, in this uh, IPS um, it creates um, a need for us to have a, um, a very well-defined process. How do we uh, cooperate with the national authorities which are responsible for the direct supervision of the uh, LSIs? and then ECB, which is responsible for the direct supervision of the SIs, uh, in the case uh, that there has to be a decision made regarding this uh, IPS. Uh, and the idea is that, uh, that these decisions would be made uh, in a fully coordinated and consistent way. So if there is, for instance, a new application for an IPS that covers both significant and less significant institutions, this would be done in a coordinated fashion um, with the national uh, authorities. And then secondly, uh, this monitoring, uh, the at least annual monitoring, which is uh, required, uh, we um, uh, have to establish uh, uh, joint monitoring uh, together with the NCAs. And this uh, is already uh, quite well underway. And from an IPS perspective, um, uh, we would like to have a single contact point uh, for each of the IPS that is uh, subject to this uh, monitoring and this will then facilitate our uh, interaction uh, with, the, uh, with the IPS, uh, which will then be simultaneous uh, together with the ECB and NCA so that we don't have a separate communication uh, with the IPS from the NCA and from the ECB, but it should be always uh, joint and well coordinated. Uh, regarding the criteria uh, for the IPS uh, assessment, uh, uh, well, the first key issue is that uh, uh, the IPS needs to be able to provide sufficient support and in a timely man manner uh, to uh, a member that uh, faces these solvency or liquidity uh, problems. Uh, and we say that there should be a clear commitment uh, to provide support uh, from, from, uh, when necessary uh, and that there should be a clearly defined process uh, how this uh, and these support actions would be, would be taken, uh, and that there should be a, a clear uh, governance and decision-making structure, uh, which would allow them timely uh, decisions. Uh, and then uh, there should be financial capacity as well, in terms of uh, funds uh, readily available, um, and there should be an ex-ante fund uh, uh, 
uh, available for these support uh, purposes. Uh, there might be uh, some conditions that are linked to the, the support operations, uh, uh, su such as uh, changes in the management, for instance, which uh, uh, can be useful to avoid uh, or limit moral hazard uh, problems. Um, regarding the, the uh, uh, commitment to support, uh, uh, first of all, we uh, have made clear that it doesn't have to be always uh, a financial uh, support, but it can be also some other measures, uh, some other measures like uh, mergers, uh, uh, risk limits, uh, uh, divesti divesting uh, risk positions or something else uh, that can be taken to, to correct the, the problem. Um, so it doesn't have to be necessarily a capital uh, um, injection or liquidity provision. Um, and the um, 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 uh, intervention um, would be expected at least when it, it is seen that uh, there is uh, no um, means for the individual bank to privately to, uh, to fix uh, the, uh, the issue. Um, and regarding Pillar 1 requirements, uh, uh, we, see, we see that there should be um, uh, a clear commitment to, to maintain uh, the, the bank above Pillar 1 requirements, and if the bank has a Pillar 2 requirement, additionally, uh, there uh, uh, should be a timeline that is set by the supervisor to meet that, uh, uh, meet that uh, requirement, and then we would expect the IPS to intervene if this uh, timeline cannot be uh, met. Um, the, the second uh, main uh, uh, area uh, is that uh, the IPS needs to be able to identify at an early stage uh, financial problems uh, of uh, an individual uh, member uh, and uh, therefore be able to take also uh, early and preventive uh, actions. Um, and um, uh, it is uh, needed that the IPS has uh, um, a clear uh, methodology for risk uh, measurement uh, that is applied to individual IPS members and uh, there should be a regular monitoring of the individual uh, members uh, uh, and a sort of classification of the riskiness of the uh, insti institutions. Um, that means that uh, the IPS members should be providing uh, information at the regular uh, intervals uh, uh, to the uh, IPS center uh, in order to, to conduct this uh, monitoring on, on a regular uh, basis. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we also consider that, uh, that there should be some possibility for the IPS to influence the, the risk uh, situation and risk management at the level of the individual uh, uh, institutions and that the IPS uh, uh, members uh, uh, are informed about problems uh, if those are uh, detected by the, by the center. Um, that uh, is the basic uh, content of the, of the criteria. Um, I'm not going now into, into further detail um, regarding those uh, criteria. Um, uh, we are now... Um, uh, quite well uh, underway in this uh, public consultation. Uh, we are having now the public hearing uh, and then uh, 15th of uh, April uh, there is the ending of this, uh, this consultation. Uh, and uh, you are uh, still of course uh, able to uh, provide uh, uh, comments uh, to us um, in writing um, uh, until that time. And then after that, uh, we will be uh, finalizing this, uh, this work. And the, uh, the plan is that uh, this uh, uh, IPS uh, um, criteria that, uh, that uh, have been consulted and we have incorporated uh, the feedback uh, uh, will be issued as a part of the uh, ECB guide on uh, options and, and discretions. So this is the bigger project that has been going on. Uh, covering uh, many uh, uh, options where the ECB has uh, uh, been um, developing and has already decided uh, uh, a common position how those options should be applied uh, uh, in the uh, SSM. Uh, and the timing uh, is uh, uh, such that uh, we are 
planning to issue the um, amended uh, uh, options and national discretions guide, which has also been consulted with the industry uh, in summer 2016. Um, so this is a bit vague uh, concept because there's, there are many definitions of summer. For me, summer is from June to August, but uh, the Mediterranean people, the summer is from uh, August to September. <laughs> So this gives uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, flexibility. <laughs> so it should be before October, I think. <laughs> That's the. Okay, I think I would um, uh, leave it to here. And uh, as Rolf said, uh, we are here to answer your uh, your questions. Okay, and um, we have microphones in the room. So, and please let me know uh, or us know who you, you are and what your organization is. It's switched on already. Thank you, Herbert Fahler and Austrian Savings Banks, representing IPS, of course. Um, two questions for clarification, basically. You were mentioning on the second slide the, the link between IPS and DGS. Um, when it comes to the fund, do you see the possibility that one fund uh, covers both objectives, the objective of the DGS and also the objective of the IPS? Because of the end of the day, both measures, meaning support of IPS members uh, and also protection of deposits, are covered by this ex ante fund, which means if I save, if I support one member, that means at the end of the day also the deposits of this, that relevant bank are covered and, and safe. The second question would be on, uh, you mentioned you are thinking of coming up with improvements? In which direction are you heading in this regard? Are you thinking of improvements when it comes to the supervisory process? Or are you thinking on level one text as well? Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for the first question. Um, uh, it is possible, uh, but then, uh, uh, of course, we need to be clear on the different purposes of the funds so that uh, the DGS funding requirement has to be always met and then uh, the, uh, um, um, in a way then the, the funds available for the solvency support uh, can, be, can be limited or you cannot uh, uh, deploy the, the, the fund for solvency purposes such that the, the DGS uh, uh, the protection or deposit protection is uh, is uh, jeopardized because typically the case for the solvency support comes before you you have to pay to the depositors which is then later later on uh, typically in the in the process if the bank goes to to resolution or uh, liquidation uh, at the end uh, if the IPS for some reason is not uh, managing to to uh, uh, to uh, solve the situation, which of course is it's expected that the, the IPS would be able to solve, but there has to be the funding um, uh, uh, available for deposit uh, uh, support uh, purposes as well. Uh, regarding the uh, improvements, uh, I mean, we are now only starting with this new supervisory process. Uh, during the spring, uh, well, we will start with the uh, so-called monitoring groups, where we have uh, both the ECB and the uh, NC, NCA representatives that th then will be organized for one uh, uh, IPS. Uh, and these uh, uh, groups will start uh, looking together uh, more in detail the, the IPS, the information that is available, uh, and then, uh, uh, then uh, see also how the risk uh, monitoring is, is organized in these uh, uh, IPS uh, uh, systems. And then there can be some, as always, when supervisors look at uh, something, there can be some um, recommendations or some requirements uh, to improve uh, in the IPS. But we are quite uh, uh, early now. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to say because we haven't started this work. Uh, uh, what kind of feedback uh, then uh, would, be, uh, would be given. Um, we uh, also um, need to collect uh, um, some uh, uh, information at the level of the IPS. Uh, the IPS has to produce the aggregated balance sheet, the aggregated capital calculation, and then information, of course, uh, to the supervisor to see how the uh, risk uh, uh, monitoring in the IPS, uh, IPS work, uh, work. But we haven't uh, uh, yet received this information, uh, and this will be then, uh, uh, this will be the work for, for this year. Uh, 
Paul Kegelmann, European Association of Cooperative Banks. I would just also like, after these questions related to the DGS, um, raise two questions or, or proposals. I mean, we saw now uh, that you, you mentioned DGS in the slide. Unfortunately, there is no reference at all in the paper itself. But there is this mechanism regarding what was just discussed to keep a minimum amount of funds in the DGS if you apply alternative measures. So that would also possibly be quite nice to establish a reference to, to see how these mechanisms work together. The other point is that uh, you expect stress tests to be done by the IPS, but also the DGS have to do stress tests, and also the stress tests for the DGS include alternative measures. So it would also possibly be quite nice to, if you could uh, clarify how these two things, at least in the paper, possibly not today, how these things work together then. Thank you. Um, Yes, this is a, an important issue. Uh, we didn't cover the DGS uh, in the uh, document because uh, uh, DGS uh, supervision is not uh, the, the, the responsibility for, for the SSM uh, directly. Uh, but of course, there is a link to DGS which, which has to be taken into account. Uh, and uh, uh, there should be cooperation in the future to avoid uh, any duplicated uh, requests. Uh, but this will, this, as you say, this is a, this is a work for f for future, and uh, we will then uh, then uh, see in practice how this will uh, will be carried out. But uh, yes, it's not covered or, uh, covered in the document. Thank you. Uh, Martin Sutaski with the uh, German Savings Banks. Um, first of all, um, let me say that I um, that we appreciate very much um, that the ECB um, acknowledges the the importance of IPS with the with the uh, proposed guide, and um, even though they are only um, uh, known sort of in in three countries of the SSM, um, they do represent, as you as you pointed out, 50% um, of, of of all banks in the SSM. Um, now, I have um, a couple of remarks that I would like to make, and the first remark also relates to the DGS um, topic that was just addressed. Um, we would like to, um, to suggest um, to, to have a very close look and to ensure that the IPS guide will be um, compatible with the um, DGS regulation, i.e. the DGS directive and the EBA guidelines uh, that relate to, to the DGS. Uh, contribution calculation, for example, or stress testing, all of these topics, and um, um, we we um, have a, uh, a, a uh, an inclination that there could be room for for a conflict between the the limit of 100,000 euros uh, deposit protection and the the broader scope of the uh, failure protection of an IPS. Um, now, my other remarks uh, relate to um, to an issue that has been discussed um, very often uh, with regard to IPSs, um, uh, moderate hazard, uh, where um, um, obviously the, the, the question is whether an IPS that is sort of insufficiently designed would create um, adverse incentives for free riders within the IPS. And um, because of that problem, of course, it's very important to have measures in place to, uh, to prevent that. And, um, we think that there are two very crucial measures um, that are very important, that they, they, they are also reflected in the guide, um, thankfully, and, and, and that's my, very much appreciated. The first one is proactivity, where we think that um, a risk management um, needs to be in place um, to, um, um, to, early, to detect uh, problems very, very early in the process and to intervene and to have um, different uh, steps of intervention um, at hand. Um, however, we think that the current wording in, in the guide um, may also be read as um, that members of an IPS need to have uniform risk management standards. Um, now, of course, there needs to be comparability, that's, that's true, but um, we, um, we think, and, and that's of course the, the regulatory framework as well, that the um, that the managers of a bank and the board um, ultimately is re responsible for a proper risk management. So, um, considering that IPS members are 
autonomous uh, banks and institutions, um, we we would suggest to to re uh, reword the the guide in that regard um, as to to not make that um, implication. Um, the other measure that I think is very important to prevent moral hazard is um, to have individual case rulings in an IPS. If you um, have um, direct claims in an IPS, um, you always risk a situation where the IPS may be regarded as an uh, insurance, as an insurance type protection. And so to avoid that, we think that um, there need to be individual case rulings. And um, we think that the consultation paper, which currently very strongly suggests a um, automated mechanism, um, should also be uh, amended in, in that regard and that relates to 113.7b. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, uh for these uh, remarks, uh, which uh, probably you will also submit uh, during the consultation, uh, so we will uh, certainly take uh, take a look at these uh, these um, uh, comments uh, very carefully. Um, um, I mean the the the. Um, uh, the relationship with the DGS uh, was already mentioned by the the previous uh, uh, speaker. Um, I think this is a, the, a really a sort of next stage uh, question where we'll, we'll then see um, see how in, in practice uh, the different IPS that might be also DGS uh, uh, function. Uh, um, we we are not uh, uh, develop, developing the, the the criteria regarding the DGS function as uh, as I mentioned it's outside the scope of uh, of our work. But there has to be of course uh, due regard and cooperation uh, with the. With the responsible authorities on the on the DGS uh, side, uh, the moral hazard issue. I mean, we um, have recognized that, that uh, uh, well. We we can uh, of course take a look at the different wordings. Uh, uh, I must say that uh, in the in the in the preparation of the the criteria, we uh, we spent really a lot of time in in finding. Uh, um, a very balanced approach, but of course it doesn't mean that it cannot be improved. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, the, we came up with this thing after a long uh, deliberation. We came up with this uh, this uh, wording of of uh, uh, there should be clear commitment, there should be sufficient funding, there's a clear expectation, uh, uh, but we are avoiding. Uh, uh, sort of automatism in the in the in the, in, in those uh, those uh, uh, expressions um, yeah, regarding the the question and or comment that uh, that we uh, uh, demand uniform risk management. Uh, I don't think that's the case, uh, but we of course uh, need to have uh, consistency so that uh, the uh, individual members of the IPS can be monitored and also there can be. Uh, uh, confidence that the risks are managed well at the level of the individual uh, banks. I don't know if you want to add something, Esther? No, I think um, you already summarized this quite well. So the, the idea is not to, to impose something um, very detailed on all institutions, but really to ensure, first of all, that the, managed and the, uh, the risks are managed properly in the individual institutions, and also that the, the IPS has the possibility to have really a clear view on the situation of the banks, and therefore you need to have some comparability in the data. And also the point that the, the support uh, uh, can uh, maybe even should come with the conditions uh, uh, can be important to limit uh, the moral hazard. So there should be also consequences uh, to the individual institutions if they need to resort to, uh, to IPS supports. Piotr Bednarski, PwC. I'm very glad to be invited here to this hearing. I like very much the paper. I would like just to share a few observations. Uh, I think one, per, one aspect has been already taken on the board, which is the relation to DGS, but also I would add relation to resolution, because I understand this paper assumes as a fundamental principle that the last line of defense will be resolution, right? And the resolution techniques, resolution fund is available. So I understand that we don't assume that the IPS will be the final say of the, in terms of the rescuing the bank. There is another line. So I understand that um, 
Uh, we can, uh, there is a, an underlying assumption that the funds should be available, the funds should support liquidity and solvency of the problem banks in the IPS, but there might be a case that the institution is no longer viable, it's not economically viable, it should be either, uh, let's say, divided into bad and good bank, uh, sold with application of all these uh, resolution rules and, and techniques. So I understand that this, this perhaps could be clarified, that the IPS is not panacea for, for, for everything. It's, it's, it has some limitations. The second issue is proportionality. I see a little bit too little of proportionality here. And I, this refers also to the question of having uniform uh, risk management system. I think this could be read between lines, that there is an expectation of that nature in this document. So I would stress more proportionality and stress that, the, the, for example, small banks do not need to have such robust systems systems like, let's say, central bank, right, or whatever. So that, that's the, the second one. The, the third one is, the question is, uh, to what extent you, you would look at this availability of funds in terms of the having unlimited right of the central institution to draw on funds from single institutions, small cooperative banks or saving banks, because this this, this could be dangerous, in fact, because IPS is, cannot endanger a single member, right? I understand that you, you would acknowledge that there should be also some provisions saying that the contribution, especially extraordinary ad hoc uh, special contributions, when the, the pot is empty, that this kind of contributions cannot go above the financial possibility of single members. And I think there are, for example, I look into uh, Raiffeisen and Prospectus issuing uh, subordinated, or the, the issuing debt international markets, and they clearly say the contribution, 50% of earnings for three years period, and the maximum extra contribution is 25% of surplus own funds over the um, uh, uh, regulatory threshold. I understand th this document assumes this kind of backstop measure, so you cannot draw too much on the single institution uh, because it might endanger this single institution. I understand this is underlying this assumption, please confirm. And the, and the last point is, there is the reference to Article 113, Paragraph 6, when there is this Mm, the requirements that there, should be, there shouldn't be any legal or practical impediment in regarding flow of own funds in the group. Uh, and I would appreciate if you could clarify, because even the wording of the, of the CRR in that respect is not fully clear. Uh, what, what do you mean exactly and how you would access this, uh, this criterion? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the link to resolution, um, it's true that it's not covered um, also in the document, but I mean the resolution uh, um, arrangements are there, uh, of course, uh, um, existing for also banks that, uh, that are part of IPS, but there has to be, um, according to the BRD, there has to be the resolution uh, uh, test and uh, that the, the criteria for resolution are met, such as the public interest criteria and the other criteria. And there is also, of course, the possibility of, of liquidation, so the resolution is not uh, an automatic uh, uh, automatic uh, possibility. Um, the proportionality issue, I mean, we will uh, go through the guideline uh, very carefully regarding this comment uh, uh, that, uh, the, the, that it delivers the, the uh, correct message uh, on what is expected from the uh, individual uh, bank level uh, risk uh, management. Uh, and uh, I fully agree that uh, if you have a um, um, if you have a IPS with uh, uh, significant institutions that, are, that can be very large and complex, uh, that's, it's a different type of risk management that is required from the, from the primary banks. Um, regarding the availability of, of funds, uh, uh, we, uh, um, uh, we note that, uh, that uh, um, in a way, the, the, if there is a cap to the uh, individual bank contributions, uh, it should not be a sort of fixed or um, irrevocable in the sense that if there's a need uh, that might have to be exceeded. And uh, there is also a commission view that uh, uh, each bank shall be obliged to provide the institutional protection schemes with the funds that are necessary to, to protect uh, its members. Uh, but of course, as you say, I mean, uh, the stability of the IPS itself or the individual other members uh, has to be considered. So this is not uh, 
uh, not to be not to be uh, jeopardized, of course. But I mean, this is an area where where uh, we cannot say that if there is a uh, original cap uh, established, that uh, there might cannot be any conditions where. Uh, additional funds might be needed. Uh, I leave the last question on regulation to Esther. Yes, so um, you're right, the wording in CRR is quite difficult to understand in this regard, and also to have this link for IPS that are not consolidated banking groups and that normally also have limited um, yeah, investments uh, in own funds in the group. But um, I mean, it is a requirement. We would look. Uh, we would use the similar um, specifications that were uh, prepared for uh, Article Seven. That also includes this uh, condition that there should be no practical and legal impediment. So we, we would see if there is anything in the status of the institutions. If there are any contracts that might hamper. The, the transfer of own funds or also the repayment of liabilities. But what is really most important point in this risk regard is the role of the IPS. I mean, normally if there is a need for support, the, the IPS would have an intermediate role to, to organize the support and to, to channel also liquidity or funds. And this needs to be taken into account in this regard, that uh, it's really not comparable with the um, with the group and the conditions uh, that are uh, set out for the group. So. Yes, uh, I want to come back possibly to the issue that was just addressed by the uh, need to, or the possibility to uh, introduce more funds into the money into the funds. Uh, that brings back also the discussion on the commitment on, of the IPS to support. I mean, you have put here a very strong sentence uh, that the IPS should not be allowed to re refuse to provide support measures if that would lead to the insolvency. Now, the fund is completely already depleted. If there is no mon money in the fund, it would in fact cause that the whole, it would uh, create a whole, st the default of a single institution could trigger then also the default of the whole IPS. Uh, wouldn't that also go a bit too far? Um, uh, yes, I mean, as I said, the, uh, in a way, the, the stability of the IPS uh, and the individual other members uh, has to be taken into account. Uh, but then on the other side, we have the um, a clear text in the CRR that uh, the IPS is there to prevent bankruptcy. Um, so in a way, uh, we have uh, uh, tried to, to uh, find uh, this, uh, this kind of wording that uh, uh, is, uh, is appropriate. So there is uh, indeed a very strong expectation uh, and there should be a commitment to, to, to provide support when, when necessary and there should be the financial capability. But uh, uh, but of course, I mean the uh, the, the uh, uh, support to an individual bank uh, could have some limits, uh, uh, and then some other options might be might be required: resolution or liquidation. Uh, uh, but I mean, this is this is the the wording, and as I said, uh, we we are certainly looking into the uh, wordings uh, very carefully. Uh, uh, this text that you refer to uh, is. Uh, Probably not in the criteria itself, but Esther can. Uh, um, uh, yeah. can yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would yeah. need to check now if it's yeah. in the document, but. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, I know that the sentence is there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I mean, of course, there would also always mm. be the need to, to assess all these individual cases, also the support cases individually. I mean, there's yes, no indeed, uh, yeah. blueprint, yeah. Yeah. or you cannot already uh, decide now what should happen. Um, for all and every support case in the future. Good. However, no, no, go ahead. Mm. Try again. Ben. Good morning, Ralph Benner, German Cooperative Banks. Um, just to stress one. One topic which is, uh, from our point of view, very important. Uh, after reading the consultation documents, we have got the impression that some of the points uh, um, which are in these documents might go too deep into detail um, 
on the level of a single bank, which is more or less a micromanagement level. We, we um, want to comment this uh, in our written statement, but want, want to show our um, uh, concerns uh, in, in one example. Um, when we look inside the uh, documents on Article uh, 137, Lit C, and there, uh, single the point four, um, there is uh, defined, and we agree very much with this, that an IPS um, should define common risks and risk categories. Absolutely correct and uh, essential. But uh, then uh, you, you added some points uh, which are, um, from all point of view, far too detailed. For example, um, that you write there to have one common confidence level and one common time horizon for measuring risks. Uh, we don't think that this is uh, necessary for, for banks which are uh, legally independent in an IPS. Uh, it is important to have an overall monitoring process to have a view on these topics, but not to define such a detailed level for, for a single bank within an IPS. Um, yes, I mean, um, as I mentioned already before, I mean, the idea is not to standardize completely the risk management of uh, single uh, uh, institutions. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there has to be comparability of the information. So if one bank is uh, reporting apples to the center and the other one, one oranges, it doesn't work. So I mean, the, the, the key risk measures that uh, uh, are uh, collected centrally and monitored by the center and then leading to the risk classification of the individual members, leading to the uh, early warning signals uh, that are needed, th th those key measures would have to be uh, comparable, and uh, and the, this uh, uh, this point is is uh, is really uh, intended to ensure the uh, ensure comparability. I mean, for instance, if you have a, a credit risk measure with a different confidence level used or different time horizons, you don't have comparability. Uh, but of course, we will uh, take on board these comments uh, and review the comments where you you think that uh, that the the criteria are, uh, are uh, uh, going uh, into too much detail, so of course we will review those. So would be very happy to, to really to have the individual points uh, concretely. Yeah? Just, a, just a spontaneous yeah. reaction. Yeah. Um, from our point of view, the risk of an IPS is not the single risk of a single business done by a bank. The risk of our IPS are the banks themselves, and we have uh, figures and measures to um, monitor and to judge the risk of the bank as a whole, not on the level of the single contract signed by a bank, not on the level of the uh, confidence level the bank uses to judge if their own business are okay, because the bank itself has to fulfill all the official regulation and rules of, um, um, of a normal bank. Mm. So we have to divide between these two perspectives, looking on a bank? Mm. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, yes, maybe one, one thing to, to clarify is that, uh, uh, that we have to have this uh, comparable uh, monitoring or risk measurement in place so that the different banks in the IPS can be uh, monitored on a comparable basis. So that's, uh, that's clear. But then on the other hand, uh, the bank itself uh, is uh, independent and can also have some additional uh, risk management measures um, for its own use that is uh, suited to, hit to, the, to the particular uh, uh, businesses and it's, it's, it's very much tailored uh, for the needs of the management of that bank. Uh, so this is absolutely possible, but the, the key is that we need to have uh, something that, uh, that is strong and comparable uh, across uh, institutions, but the individual banks can also have some additional uh, measures, of course, in the risk management. Good morning, Michel Bilger, Credit Agricole. Um, I have a question on uh, the criteria H of the CRR, Article 113.7. Uh, it refers to the homogeneous um, business model of uh, the banks of the network. Uh, could you clarify, because it's not uh, really clear, um, how you will assess uh, this? Uh, 
uh, especially in two cases, if you have a network of uh, banks, uh, with banks uh, more specialized in one area on uh, corporate business, and the other on retail, is it an obstacle? And uh, another case is uh, if you have a capital market which concentrates the inflows and outflows of the IPS uh, for the treasury side, is it an obstacle? Mm. Thank you. The, thank you very much uh, uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, uh, we, in a way, concluded that uh, uh, it's not possible to define some uh, quantitative uh, thresholds uh, uh, to uh, address the, the criteria of homogeneous business profile. Uh, what is important is that uh, uh, when there are different kind of uh, institutions uh, inside the IPS, uh, banks uh, that are very different in size and very different in, in the business uh, 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 the approaches, uh, then there, there should be a sort of co common uh, link that they, they, these activities uh, should be, uh, should be uh, in a way linked to the a network of banks that are in the IPS that can be some services for the IPS members. Uh, and then the, we should be looking at the, the, the amount of business that is completely dissociated with the, with the uh, business of the, of the IPS majority members and the, and the IPS network. Uh, Esther, you would like to, to add something yeah, and, on this? And we see also a link of this condition uh, again to the to the risk monitoring by the IPS. So, uh, what is really important is even if there are perhaps a bit diffi uh, different activities by the uh, by the member institutions, um, the the IPS still needs to be in a position to to assess the risk of this institution. So the systems of the IPS need to be um, then appropriate to cover all these different kind of activities and institutions. But um, I mean, it's clear that there's also some, um, it's a question of, of cooperation within the uh, IPS networks and uh, that there might be uh, yeah, some specifications in some institutions in these groups and that not everybody is really doing exactly the same. I think there is another question in the back. Uh, Piotr Bednarski again. Juka, as, uh, as a former supervisor, I, I also look at the question of powers of supervisor, and here it, there is a context of IPS having sufficient power over, uh, as we call it, free riders or against those who exercise moral hazard, etc. Everything is very fine here, and I think there should be some measures w which are applicable. The question is what kind of measures and to what, to what uh, to what kind of intervention, to do what depth of intervention we should, we should allow. Because on the other hand, we've got also supervisors who have superpowers, nuclear powers, right? So wh where is this balance? Because on one hand, I saw the IPS contract, for example, where the, there are powers are huge, including uh, the monetary uh, penalties imposed on the individual CEO of cooperative banks, including uh, monetary penalty imposed on the institutions, not to say expulsion from the, uh, from the, from the association, from the IPS. Uh, how would you judge this sufficiency of the powers of the IPS? And the second question is uh, also, this refers to homogeneity and the question of the proportionality, because in IPS, there is, in many IPSs, there are natural, uh, non-homogeneous situation. You've got central bank, which has oftentimes robust international operations with a lot of trading, oftentimes uh, uh, not very, uh, not very, I would say, secure trading. And th th this story repeats every 10 years that uh, one of the central bank of, IP of the association took too much risk in London and we've got losses and the cooperative banks are angry that they had to pay again, etc. So uh, how would you apply proportionality in that respect? Because some groups won't be homogeneous. That's from, from, from the definition because of central bank being much more powerful, having more, much more business at different type of business and small banks are oftentimes very limited. So powers of the, of the IPS, how would you look at that and the question of homogeneity? Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. I mean, uh, uh, in a sense, this is um, uh, a question that is uh, not easy to answer at this stage because uh, we are in the early stage. We are just starting the joint monitoring uh, uh, of the IPS uh, together with the NCAs. Uh, 
Uh, we did have a look at the, the governance structures uh, in this review of IPS uh, that we did before, but, uh, but we don't have a lot sort of a, a supervisory assessment uh, of the governance, uh, how it works and what would be our, um, our uh, recommendations or, or uh, requirements or uh, um, uh, input to the, to, the, to the IPS. So, so this remains to be, be seen. It, it, I mean, it's a, it's a, um, a delicate issue in the sense that, uh, that this is not a group where the center can uh, uh, demand something from the uh, individual uh, institutions. Uh, this is uh, a bunch of uh, autonomous institutions, so there is a limit, of course, to the powers of the center. But on the other hand, uh, there should be a, a clear governance framework. There should be a framework what happens in the case of a, uh, of a support, and there should be also the ability to uh, to, to steer and uh, and ask the information from the from the IPS. So there should be should, should be a, a possibility to uh, to influence, and also a possibility to influence at an early stage. But how this is actually done, uh, uh, it is too early to to comment. Good morning, Emanuele Espina from the Italian Association of Cooperative Banks. Um, we have a question uh, regarding the uh, setting up of new IPSs, so the constitutions or the application for, for a new IPS. And the uh, question comes from the consideration that experience tells that the uh, uh, financial capacity of an IPS is built through time, obviously. So then the question is, how would you uh, intend to assess the funding capacity uh, of a new IPS? Um, or uh, is there going to be a sort uh, or some room for flexibility until, until a floor is reached? Um, so if you can tell us some uh, indications about this. Thank you. Um. Yes, um, I would think that there, there is, uh, again, a sort of case-by-case -case assessment. Uh, um, I mean, we, we, we think that the ex-ante fund uh, should be available, and then there should be also the overall assessment of the sufficiency of the, of the funds for, for support. But, I mean, if there's a new IPS that starts uh, uh, from scratch, uh, the, the fund uh, uh, can have a transitional uh, period. Uh, Unless you have something else to add on that, so it's a yeah, bit perhaps. Uh, but uh, yeah. of course, yeah. when we assess if, for example, the the uh, condition that there are funds readily available is fulfilled, so um, it needs to be taken into account what is already there and available in the funds. And uh, I don't think, personally, that it's possible to to grant all these permissions when there is nothing available at the moment. I mean, how this is then going to be built up, this is a different yeah. question, but there is some level of um, ER security or uh, of funds need to be there yeah, also, also in the beginning. The beginning. Yes. Yes. Christoph Rübenacker, uh, representing the IPS of the cooperative uh, German banks. Um, we try to find out whether um, your um, pro uh, proposal covers exactly what is written in the CRR 113.7. And just to give you one example, um, we ask ourselves uh, concerning point D, um, whether the risk re reviews you are uh, describing there is responsible for the whole sector uh, or whether the risk reports uh, have to be um, given out to all the member banks. Uh, the BVR, we've got our own classification system, and of course, every bank gets their own classification. But we've got the question whether you really mean that you uh, want us to uh, give the whole um, risk review of the whole sector to each individual bank. Because we think it's more important to give them their own individual classification, but not the risk review of the whole system itself. So this is one point where we ask whether uh, the CRR is uh, covered exactly. Mm. That's meaning. Um, I mean, I, I think as you say, the the of course the the minimum is that the individual bank uh, gets the, the information. 
and then the, it depends how the, the system is organized. There can be some kind of a committee uh, that uh, reviews the, the risk position of individual banks. They need to receive the information. Uh, but the full distribution, Esther, I leave that to you, what, uh, what we uh, meant in the, in the, in the guideline. I think what we have in mind is also that uh, the the, in, the individual members of the IPS should also have some uh, information on the overall situation of the IPS as a whole. I mean, yes. the level of detail, this is, can be discussed, but um, to understand also the um, the risks for, for the IPS or, or the, the, the potential contribution of the individual members, I think it's um, also necessary to get some kind of overview. But of course, the, the main uh, point is that the institutions are informed on their classification. I mean, this is... Okay, that seems to be a point that we should be clarifying. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Are there any more questions in the room? There is. Um, over there. Thank you. Hello, my name is Arthur Reisenberger for Rivers Central Bank. Uh, you told us uh, in your starting statement that you're not going to challenge the decisions of the NCAs. And, uh, well, with the, in, in respect to the, the, the original decision, I think in our case all the requirements which are now included in this uh, consultation paper are already uh, incorporated in the various uh, conditions. But anyway, it's quite interesting for us in which situation you think about reassessing uh, the um, uh, uh, reasons for the uh, uh, granting of the, the IP IPS and therefore, to bring it to the point, um, would be, for example, the participation of a new member in the IPS or the exit of a member or the merger of a member and a non-member uh, also uh, lead to a reassessment of the entire IPS uh, decision? Or do you have a, a clear uh, um, focus on, on uh, situations when you are going to reassess uh, the, the original uh, IPS decision of the NCA? Um, uh, yes, it is true, and uh, as, uh, as uh, I said in the beginning, that uh, the, the earlier permissions uh, are fully respected and there's no um, uh, objective to, to start a fully fledged uh, review uh, of the previous decisions, uh, but then, uh, I mean, if uh, there is a ma if there is a major structural change in the IPS, uh, if it's just one member joining, uh, that may not be a major structural change. But if there is a significant change, uh, then you might have to reassess uh, whether the the criteria are met, or if there is a incident. Uh, in the IPS that uh, uh, gives uh, a reason to, to the supervisors to, to, to think that uh, the IPS is not functioning in the way it should be according to the, to the criteria. So in these cases you, you might have to, to assess the, the compliance as well. Um, and then there is the ongoing uh, m monitoring uh, that the, for instance, the risk monitoring system is well functioning. Uh, and then we have uh, some additional decisions that might have to be taken for the uh, already existing IPS. For instance, if uh, uh, the, the IPS uh, uh, ask for uh, waivers of the liquidity requirements at the level of individual banks uh, uh, and ask the, the liquidity to, to be assessed at the, the global level, uh, then uh, you would have to assess whether the uh, conditions for that uh, are met uh, uh, this is not a sort of automatic, uh, automatic uh, decision coming from the IPS recognition as such, uh, like the zero percent risk weight for uh, 
uh, interbank exposures, that is an automatic. So once an IPS is recognized, there is automatically the 0% risk weight, but not automatically the liquidity waiver. So that we would uh, uh, have to assess whether the conditions are there to, to have this kind of, uh, uh, kind of waiver. Thank you. Yes, it's uh, well understood that, uh, for example, for the waiver, there would be an additional application. But uh, uh, is, uh, do you have a, a clear uh, focus on, on when you're going to reassess the, uh, the IPS decision itself? Uh, no, for, no, no, no. I, no. I mean, we uh, we don't have any plan to review the past decisions. It's not our focus to go through the past decisions and reassess them. Uh, but it will be case by case. I mean, if something is coming up from the regular uh, the regular monitoring of the IPS, or if there is a major structural change or incidents, uh, uh, then that might trigger the the supervisory assessment. But. Uh, uh change of a member might not automatically be a major structural change? No. 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 Okay. Uh, if it's... Uh, depends, on the <laughs> depends on the member, yes. <laughs> what is classified as a significant change. Uh, if it's uh, one bank uh, in the valley of Austria, then it may not be, but may not be. In one, in one valley of Austria. <laughs> Holger Mielk, uh, also representing the German cooperative banks. May I add one question um, uh, to uh, what uh, my previous speaker asks? Um, have I understood you right that, um, for example, if uh, we ask for the waiver from uh, Article 49, Paragraph 3 from the CRR, that that might lead uh, to uh, a new assessment uh, of uh, the fulfilling of the requirements of Article 113, no, no, Paragraph 7? Uh, I didn't mean that. Uh, what I meant was, uh, and I hope I was clear, because uh, I, I thought I had a clear answer, uh, that uh, um, it is the, the um, uh, individual uh, assessment of whether that waiver could be granted. It's not uh, uh, the assessment of the, the past criteria, but it's, uh, if it's the liquidity waiver, then of course you have to assess whether uh, the liquidity is uh, well managed at the level of the, the IPS, uh, whether there's free movement of, of liquidity when needed, uh, whether there's support coming if one bank, uh, bank is uh, losing liquidity. I mean, this kind of thing that is uh, related to the uh, issue itself. Yeah. Great. Unless there's uh, another last minute question, I think we uh, have come to an end. Thank you very much everybody for coming and for uh, asking interesting questions and uh, bring forward your suggestions. And uh, as Ayuka said a, a couple of times, uh, send in your comments in writing. That's always uh, much easier to, to um, assess them and to put them into the process so that we can, can uh, take them into account and have a look at them. Thanks a lot and uh, have a safe travel home. Yes, thank you very much also from um, uh, our side and uh, looking forward to receiving uh, further comments. Thank you very much.